Amen. So, <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapter number 3, I'm just going to be preaching through the first uh, 22 verses tonight, because I think there's a really great truth that we can see, a couple examples of a great truth right here in these first 22 verses, and that's this saying that you probably have heard, easy come, easy go, easy come, easy go. And really what that means is that people have a tendency, it's in human nature, that uh, people take things for granted. You know, and I think we see some great examples of that here in the scripture of people who take things for granted, also people who do not take things for granted. And <clears throat> we want to uh, be a people that learn to appreciate the fact that anything that is worth having in this life is worth earning. I think that's what we can learn from these first 22 verses. Anything in your life that is worth having is worth you earning it. You know, the things that come to us real easy in life, those are the things that we tend to let go real easy as well. And we should never, uh, you know, be people who, um, you know, are opposed to or have a problem with the fact that sometimes we have to wait for things that we want or we have to put in effort for things that we want. Because when we do that, when we wait for things, when we put in the effort that's necessary and we finally receive those things that we want, you know, we will appreciate them more. And we'll see some examples of people who did, who, who did that and also who did not tonight. People who did earn what they had and those that did not. And the first person I want to look at here is Abner. And Abner, you know, uh, he was a guy who appreciated what he had. And I think that's why we see that he was such a loyal guy. You know, we know Abner was associated with Saul. And, you know, Saul was kind of a bad guy at the end. But we have to remember Saul started out as a good guy. And it doesn't mean that everybody around him was bad. Now, obviously, it was God's will that David take the throne, and Abner was kind of helping Saul, uh, you know, to resist that will, right? But and we'll even see here tonight that Abner kind of understood that this was eventually going to happen, that he was going to have to just, uh, you know, switch sides, okay? But what I want us to notice there in verse 1, it says, there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. So it wasn't like they just had that war in, in chapter 2, and then they just kind of went back and, that was it. You know, there, I, it seems like there's a lot more going on. Like there was more battles, more skirmishes. And, you know, that's probably that period between chapter two and chapter three is, is several years are going by. Right. And the chapters three and four are, are like real consecutive right at the end of the, those seven years where David's only reigning over Judah. OK, because he reigns over Judah seven and a half years. And then eventually all Israel comes under and what we're reading in chapters 3 and 4 are those last, you know, those last probably a few months, maybe a year, right before that lead up to that. So there was long war, okay? So the, they're going back and forth with each other. There's these fighting going on. And it says there in verse 1, but David waxed stronger and stronger. So who's winning? You know, it's David's side is the side that's winning the war. You know, they, they whipped them in chapter 2. And then, you know, after that, they just kept waxing stronger and stronger and they're winning. And it says that the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. So you have to remember that Abner, he's being loyal to the, lo to the losing side. You know, he's, he's, the chips are down, as they say, for him. Okay, Verse 6, And it came to pass, while there was yet war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. So Abner was a loyal guy. You know, I believe that about him. You know, you wonder why was David lamenting the fact that he died later in the chapter. It's because David... You know, one was a guy who served with him. You remember when David was, you know, part, he was a, a captain in Saul's uh, host as well. So he would have been serving alongside uh, Abner. He would have gotten to know Abner. They probably even went, fought some battles together. It wasn't like they had this impersonal, you know, relationship. They would have known who they were. They might have even spent, you know, a significant amount of time with each other before Saul began to, you know, chase David around. So, and not only that, you know, that's part of the reason probably he was lamenting, but was, he was lamenting the fact because David probably knew about Abner that he was a loyal man and that he was a good man. And I believe that about Abner. <clears throat> so, and what we see about Abner is that he's somebody who didn't just switch sides easily. You know, he didn't just flip. He didn't turn him on a dime. He's there when, you know, the, the, he's on the losing side. Saul's losing. His house is losing. And Abner's, you know what, he waxed stronger. He made himself strong. For the house of Saul. He didn't just say, well, you know what? Looks like it's over. You know, looks like they're going to win. I might as well just, you know, quit while I'm ahead and try and save my skin. You know what? He stuck with it. He stuck it out there with Saul. He didn't switch easily. It was seven years before Israel received David as king. And you have to remember that, you know, he'd been through a lot as captain with Saul. You know, he's, he's committed. And what am I saying tonight? I'm saying he's invested a lot in Saul's army, hasn't he? 
You know, if we were to go back and look in uh, 1 Samuel, you would see where Abner comes on the scene. You know, when, 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 uh, when, uh, when Saul is first made king, you know, Abner immediately becomes the captain of his host. So Abner's been by his side this whole time. What, what, is, he, what is he? He's invested in the army. You know, he's put in a lot of time. He's put a lot of literally blood, sweat, and tears into serving Saul, serving his house, serving that side, serving Israel. You know, he's invested. That's why he's not just going to, you know, switch sides that quick. That's why he's not just going to go, well, it looks like David's taken over. I'm just going to go over there now. You know why? Because he's somebody who put a lot of effort into it. And people who put effort into things, they just don't give up on them overnight. You know, people that give up over, you know, give up on things quickly, you know, it's because they didn't invest anything in it. You know, easy come, easy go, right? Now, he does obviously, can, does switch sides eventually, right? In verse uh, 7, and we see why, okay? Now, again, remember, you got to remember what's, what he's done. He's invested in them. He's put time into this army. He's led it. He's, he's got time here, okay? And he's even sticking it out when things are bad. And, and it says in verse 7, and Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aya. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou get, gone in unto my father's concubine? Now, you can kind of understand where Ishbosheth is kind of is coming from a little bit here, in the fact that, you know, when when somebody would take somebody else's concubine like that, that was kind of like a that could be interpreted as like a power play. You know, a public statement of, you know, I'm I'm rank, I've got clout. That's probably not what was going on. Maybe he just liked her, you know, because you remember that's what Absalom did with David's concubines, and he was kind of showing everybody that he was in charge now, right? So if Shbosheth, he sees this, and he gets suspicious, and you know he has reason to be suspicious, because this Bosheth, he's kind of a figurehead, you know, he's just he's just somebody, he's like the queen of England, you know, he's just he's not really doesn't have any real power. He was kind of because remember he was put in there in chapter two by Abner. It was Abner that made him king, right? So Abner, you know, he, he hears this. Ishbosheth comes to him and says, you know, you know, why have you gone in unto my father's concubine? He's like, he's basically saying, are you making a power play? Are you trying to take the kingdom? Are you trying to usurp my authority? And this makes Abner, it says in verse 8, very wroth. Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth. So this is what puts him over. To, to finally say, you know what, I'm done. I'm just going to, we're going to make David king of everybody, and I'm, I'm done with the house of Saul, right? It was that insult. It was that, uh, you know, the fact that Ishbosheth didn't appreciate his loyalty. So, you know, when, when, when you're loyal to somebody and that's not reciprocated, you know, there's a chance maybe that you, you'll stop being loyal, right, to that individual. But it took a lot for Abner to get there. Why? Because he had a lot invested, you know. He wasn't these guy, one of these guys where it just came real easy and he's let it go real easy. He worked for it. He put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. He says, Then Abner was very raw for the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show, kind, do show kindness unto Saul, how, the house of Saul, thy father, to his brethren and to his friends that have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest with me today with the fault concerning this woman? So he's saying, Look, I could have given you up at any time. I could have delivered you over to David at any time, and you know this. And, and of course, you know, silence is agreement, right? So when, when in verse, uh, uh, where, you know, later in, the, in, the, in verse 10 or 11, where it says that Ishboth says, you know, he said nothing because he was afraid, right? He clams up. He, couldn't, he could answer him nothing for he was afraid. That just shows you that Abner was right. You know, when, when somebody, you know, tells it like it is, and then you clam up, it's because they're right. And that's what's going on here. Abner, you know, just calls him out and says, am I a dog's head? You know, are you, he understands the insinuation that's being implied there. Oh, you're going into the concubine. What's going on with that? Huh? What's up? You trying to take the kingdom? And he, he, and, 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 uh, you know, Abner is wise to it and says, well, and it, he's insulted. He says, you know, I'm a dog's head. I'm showing all this loyalty. You're on the losing side. I'm still here. And if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be king. I could have delivered you anyone. This is how you're going to treat me. This is how my loyalty is repaid. So he, that's kind of what put him over the edge. So the point is this, is that, you know, Abner, yes, he switched sides, but it wasn't like he just switched sides like that. It took seven years after him bringing Ishbosheth into the kingdom, making him king, you know, trying to get things going, going to war. And he even says there, you know, 
I show kindness, uh, which against Judah do show kindness. He's like, I, he was full aware of, of that he was picking a side and going to war with his brethren, you know, for loyalty's sake, okay? But he goes ahead and he ends up making the switch, but not without having to go through a lot. He And, and you know, probably he knew what was coming the whole time. And you kind of see that in verse 9. It says in verse 9, So God do to Abner and more also, except as the Lord hath sworn to David, even so do I to him, to translate the kingdom from, how, from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel, over Judah, and from Dan even to Beersheba. So this is the guy that was with Saul, pursuing David in the wilderness, and now here he is saying, uh, so, uh, so do God to Abner and more also, except as the Lord had sworn to David. It's like he knew this was going to happen eventually but he was holding out out of loyalty's sake. And he's saying, look, this is, I see what's coming. The Lord has sworn to David, even to, so do I to him. And what I love about Abner is his transparency. He, you know, Esbosheth just, you know, kind of slanders him a little bit. He calls him on it, and then he just tells him right to his face exactly what he's going to do. <laughs> he says, look, I'm going to set up the throne of David over Israel and to over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. He says, uh, excuse me, verse 9. Except as the Lord had sworn to David, even so do I to him. He's saying, look, I'm going to make it happen just for that. Just for the fact that you didn't appreciate my loyalty. Just because of the fact that you didn't appreciate everything that I've done for you. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, do, uh, I'm going to go make David king. And he just tells him right to his face. He's very transparent. I love Abner. It says in verse 17, and you know, of course he goes around. You got to remember Abner rallied Israel. He gets, he gets Benjamin. He gets everybody on board with making David king. He said in verse 17, and, and Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, Ye sought for David in times past to be king over you. Now then, do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. So he kind of knows what's coming, and that's finally what kind of puts him over the edges when he, his loyalty goes unappreciated. Right. So he was one of these guys, you know, yes, he switched, but not without putting in a lot of effort. It took a lot to make him give up what he had, right? A lot of other people would have quit earlier because easy come, easy go. You know, he was Saul's uncle. Oh, you're my uncle. You, you be the captain. Oh, thanks. You know, and he could have taken that for granted. Like Ishbosheth, right? Ishbosheth is kind of the opposite. He's a guy who things came easy to him, and he was, you know, he just rolls right over for David. He doesn't put up any kind of a fight. He does, puts up no resistance at all. He just rolls right over. Why was that? Because he was installed by Abner, right? He was, things came easy to him. There was, he didn't have to go out and fight some battle. He didn't have to go out and kill David. <clears throat> you know, Saul was the one that was pursuing him. He wasn't, he didn't have to prove himself. They just, you know, Abner just didn't want to see the kingdom get handed over so quickly or so easily and said, well, let's just take Ishbosheth and make him king. And what that meant for Ishbosheth is that the kingdom came very easy to him, didn't it? Because you remember that in, in chapter 2, verse 8. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim and made him king over at Gilead, and so on and so forth. He's the one that installed him. So, you know, Ishbosheth just kind of walks right into this position, just steps right into it, and it's easy come, easy go for Ishbosheth. He didn't earn this position, he inherited this position. That's why he didn't appreciate it. And, you know, this is an important truth that people need to understand is that when things come easy to you, the tendency in human nature is to take them for granted. You know, and this is especially important for, you know, kids to understand, and young people to understand, is that, you know, you're living a good godly Christian life. You have a, a godly home with godly parents, and you're in a good church, and you have all, you know, the things of the Lord. You know, the, the previous generation may have not had that. You know, like, that's the case for me, you know, <laughs> Some people have to literally, they have to scrape and, and crawl to live a good, godly Christian life. They didn't have parents that are teaching these things. They didn't have parents bringing them to church, teaching them the Bible. They didn't have any of these things. They scratched and clawed to learn to live a godly life. And, and if people don't understand that, you know, that how hard it is for an undisciplined person to learn to live a disciplined life. You know, it, it's, it's you, some flaws you pick up, they're with you forever. So look, if you're one of these people that has a good godly upbringing, don't take that for granted. Because that's the tendency in human nature. That's what it was with Ishbosheth. Somebody else just sets him up, and he's just, well, easy come, easy go. You know, I didn't ask for this. This was, this was Abner's idea. 
I guess, you know, whatever. Yeah, whatever you want, David. Doesn't put up a fight, just holds his peace, does whatever they want, and, and doesn't fight back. He just lets it go easy. Why? Because it came easy. You know, and this isn't just for kids. You know, this is a truth that I can apply. You, you just, just name the area in life and you can apply this principle. This is how important it is. Easy come, easy go, okay? Think about employees. You know, the employees show up at, at work. You know, so they get there and they just, they just think, oh, the, the boss is here for me. You know, they don't, they, or they start criticizing the boss, saying, oh, you know, he must be nice being the boss. Must be nice to just roll into work, you know, make your own schedule, make all that money. Must be nice. And they take it for granted, right? But what they don't see is that that boss, when he was the only guy at that company, when he was the only guy doing all the night calls, all the day work, when he was, you know, working his fingers to the, bro to the bone, when he was putting the long hours, when he was taking, you know, and is still taking all the risks. And people can walk into a job and think like, well, it must be nice. But what you're really doing is you, is you, you fail to see how much work that that individual has put into it. You know, that, and that's why, you know, people can get a, an attitude, an ungrateful attitude. You know, that can happen in a church. You know, people can get real comfortable in church. You know, this is a real possibility for us here, isn't it? Because we're, we're under the umbrella of faithful word. And let me tell you something, that comes with some perks. Not every church gets, it starts out with, you know, nice, soft, comfortable chairs. Well, we didn't either. <laughs> it took a while. You know, some of you might come in and sit in these chairs and think, oh, these are kind of cheap. Well, you, you should have seen the chairs we started out with. Those of you that sat in those white squeaky chairs, those hard plastic chairs, you know, you, know, you, you appreciate those nice soft chairs, don't you? Right? But, you know, we, we could develop an attitude here at this church like, well, why, do, why didn't we get the nicer van? You know, well, we had the nicer van for a while, didn't we? And it had nicer AC and had that nice chrome bumper. But you know what? It belongs up there now. <laughs> That's where it goes. We should just be thankful that we have a van at all. Some churches don't have a van. They don't, everyone goes soul winning in their own vehicles. You know, we could, we could start to take things for granted in this church. You know, well, that's not my favorite flavor of Gatorade. <laughs> I want red, not yellow. It's like, well, just have water then. Maybe you'll appreciate any flavor. You know what I mean? I'm not saying anybody's like this. I'm just saying, and I'm not. <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> I'm glad nobody's head's turned when I said that. Normally, if I say something, like everyone looks at one individual, right? I'm like, oh, let's just throw that guy under the bus, right? But there's just this principle, that's the type of thing could happen. You know, I have to remind myself of this. I'm writing a sermon. I'm thinking, boy, I, I could, this could happen to me. Not everybody else just, you know, gets, to, gets a, a building given to them. Here, let me pay the rent. Here's a pulpit. Go down there. You know, go move down there. That doesn't just happen. A lot, of, a lot of the pastors I know, you know, they started from, literally from scratch. They didn't just have open their doors and have people show up that were already knew, the, knew enough of the Bible. They were already good church members, soul winning, wanted to do more. You know what I mean? Some people have to go out and make that happen. So there's a tendency for me, you know, that I didn't have to go through all that. You know, there's a tendency, I, you know, I might take that for granted. I have to remind myself of this. We all have to remind ourselves of this, that things that come easy in this life can be taken for granted. Easy come, easy go. Don't be like Ishbosheth, where you know if something comes easy to you, you should thank the Lord for it, be grateful for it, even more so. You know, if you get some godly heritage, if you have some godly upbringing, you should take, you should be especially grateful for that and not take it for granted. Like David, you should be like David, right? Because he's kind of the opposite. I mean, think about David. You have Ishbosheth who's just set up, right? He just walks right into it. And then you have David, who did what? Who earned everything he had. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who earned what he had. David earned his throne. I mean, we already went through 1 Samuel. We should already know this. Every, and I'm not going to rehearse it all. But David, we all know, he was out in the wilderness for years being pursued. I mean, he's going over the Philistines, thinking about switching sides with them. Just before, you know, he come, even gets the throne in, in Hebron, you know, he's got to go fight uh, the the you know, and take back everything in Ziklag, the Amalekites, right? I mean, the guy, he's just spent years and years just being unjustly pursued in fear of his life, out sleeping underneath the stars, just wandering around for years, wait, and, and having God tell him, you're going to be king, you're going to be king. He was anointed, he, and he knew it, and he believed it. But he had to patiently wait for that to happen. In the meanwhile, you know, it's not like he was just twiddling his thumbs. He had some, you know, mad dog after him named Saul who was trying to kill him. 
you know, David is a guy who was pursued by Saul. And even after he gets the king, kingdom here, he has to wait another seven years for Israel, all of Israel to finally come around. He has to keep fighting with Abner, keep fighting with his brethren. I mean, he's the complete opposite of Ishbosheth. He was somebody that had to earn everything that he had. You know, people that invest in what they have, people that, you know, by the sweat of their, you know, their, their face, that put in hard work and long hours, get everything they have, they appreciate it. They appreciate what they have. They tend, you know, they take better care of their things. They because they know what they went into it to get those things. Like David, you know, and here's the, and if you notice the difference there, when Ishbosheth is told, you know, right to his face, hey, I'm gonna go turn it over to David now. When Abner just comes right up and says, you know what? I mean, the Lord swore to David, and I'm just gonna go make it happen. He tells him right, and then he just clams up. He doesn't even put up a fight at all, right? Because he hasn't invested anything, he doesn't really want it. He hasn't earned it, right? Was that the way it was with David when Absalom came around? No, David, he, he, he took him out. I mean, he had to retreat for a while. We understand that. But eventually, you know, he fought for that kingdom. He went back and got it. Why? Because he was somebody that invested in it. You know, when you, when you invest in something, you're going to want to keep it. You're going to fight for it. You're not just going to let it go easy because it didn't come to you easy. Anything worth having you know, it's worth working for. <clears throat> now, another great example of this concept is uh, with Michal, David's wife. If you look there in verse 12, it says, And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? You know, and that's kind of hypothetical. Basically, what he's saying is, you know who the boss is, right? It's not Ishbosheth. Ish Everyone knew Ishbosheth was just, you know, some figurehead. Whose is the land? right? You know it's mine, David. Saying also, make thy league with me, right? He's saying, you know I'm the boss. You know I'm the one who's really in charge over here. Make thy league with me. And behold, my hand shall be with thee to bring about all Israel unto thee. <clears throat> and he said, well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. So what's David want? He wants his wife back. You know, and it's, it's interesting here because if you remember in the beginning of the chapter, he's, he, it, it lists his four other wives. And it's not, I don't think that David wants, it, wants her because of the fact that he just wants another wife to add to, you know, the count. It's because Michael was his first wife. You know, Michael was the one that loved him and he loved her and they had, you know, that right relationship. You know, again, you know, we understand that polygamy is wrong. This isn't a story you look at and say, Oh, it's okay to have multiple wives. No, the Bible just records what men did. It doesn't necessarily condone it, okay? But David, I believe, wants Michael back because of the fact, again, going back to what we're talking about, he earned her. He earned her. You know, he had invested in getting that wife. These other ones, they just kind of came to him a little bit. You know, they, they just kind of, you know, they, he didn't have to work. He certainly didn't have to work as hard as he did for Michael, okay? And he wants her back. You know, David had uh, earned her love. You know, if you remember, Michael, it says in 1 Samuel 18, she loved him. It says Michael, the Saul, uh, Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So before David, you know, this is when David is, you know, a captain, his host, he's going in and out and fighting Saul's battles. You know, his conduct, the way he carried himself, the way he lived his life, she fell in love with him. You know, she, he, he had earned her respect. And then, you know, David, you know, earned her hand. You know, he, he actually, um, you know, if you look at verse 14, he pays quite the price. It says, and David sent messengers unto Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, deliver me my wife, my call, which I espoused to me for an hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Now, look, I'm all about the bride price. I'm all about a dowry, you know, but that's not going to be it for me. Like, you know. If any of you boys out there are interested in one of my daughters, you can all bring a sigh of relief. You know, that's not what I'm going to be asking. It's going to be a side of beef, all right? And I'm talking organic, hormone-free, no pesticides. You think I'm joking. I've got a chest freezer at home right now that I'm ready to plug in, and I'm going to, you know, fire that thing up. And, and I'm just warning you now, you might as well just start, get that paper out, sell that lemonade, do an extra chore. Last I checked, a side of beef, good beef, was about three grand. And prices are only going up, right? I don't know why everyone's laughing. I'm dead serious. <laughs> I put a lot, hey, easy come, easy go. You think those, those girls over there came easy? 
You think turning out a, a, a godly young woman is easy? It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. So they're worth it. You're getting a deal if it's side of beef. Africa, it's eight cows, I've heard. I knew a guy who had to get a, wanted to marry a gal over there. Eight cows. I'm asking for a side of beef. Now, maybe the cows over there were, you know, a little scrawny or something. I don't know. <clears throat> well, you know, David earned her. That's the point I'm making here is that David, you know, he, my call didn't come easy to David. You know, and this is an important lesson when it comes to finding a spouse is that you don't want to just find somebody who comes easy. And I don't mean like they're, they're, they're loose morally. I'm saying that they don't come, you know, it's just convenient. It's just, you know, we, we have the same beliefs. You know, when I met my wife, I don't think we even, it's all, it's been so long. It's, it's all so foggy. But I think it was like two years, and she's two years before we even started dating. I don't know. But it was a long time, okay? It, it was like, and then when we finally got engaged, it was a whole nother year. You know, and I look, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's the way it has to be for everybody, but I will say this, the reason, part of the reason why I did that is because we were the only two in the church. It was me and her. And I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't just marrying somebody because they came easy because, well, they had the same principles, so I might as well marry them. I wanted to make sure that it was somebody that I, 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 could, I wanted to wait for, that it was somebody that I was going to appreciate. Why? Because I don't want my marriage to be easy come, easy go, Right. And that's what happens sometimes in marriages. Marriages just, they, they come easy, and then guess what? They can go easy too. So that's a good principle. You know, David is somebody who earned his bride. You know, and, and we understand what was going on in that story back then, is that Saul was trying to set him up, right? This, this wouldn't even be possible to go get, you know, the, the hundred foreskins of the Philistines. That ain't, that's not even something that would happen, easy, you know, probably wasn't even possible except for the fact that the Lord was with David. Okay, because Saul was doing that to try to get David killed, right? And if you remember the story, he actually went out and killed 200 Philistines. <clears throat> so that's why he's asking for her hand. That's why he's saying, look, if you want, Abner, you want to make this league, I'm all for it, but bring me my call because I earned her and I'm not letting her go easy. I put a, you know, there's a lot of hard work that went into that. <clears throat> you know, he paid the price for my call's hand, unlike... Feltiel, right? Feltiel, the, the one that she, would, that she was given to. Because remember, David gets run off. If you remember the story, you know, Michal finds out that Saul's going to try and come and kill David. So she makes the figure in the bed and then tells David to flee. And then Saul has the whole bread brought down. So he could, it's this crazy story. But she spares his life, right? And unfortunately, they, they separate and then Saul you know, to spite David, gives his wife to another man. And that man was Fatiel. Fatiel. And, you know, Fatiel in the story kind of illustrates this point of easy come, easy go, right? <clears throat> it says in verse 15, And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Fatiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went along with her, weeping behind her to Bahurim. And said, Ab, and, and then said Abner unto him, go, return. And he returned. That's kind of an interesting story, a little passage there. Like, what's going on here with this is that this guy's following after his wife, you know, and he's weeping. But that, you know, and, and people will say, boy, what a sad story. But I wonder, why was he weeping? I mean, does it say that he, because he loved her so much? Or is it because, you know, maybe he lost some status? I don't know. This, I'm, just, I'm just wondering. But people instantly assume it's all because he just loved her so much. I don't know that's necessarily the case. You know, it was a big, I mean, remember when, when Saul said, you know, whoever kills the, the Philistine, the, the, the Goliath, you know, they get to marry, be the king's son-in-law. That was like a huge, that was like the reward, right? It was a big deal. You know, and David was, you know, didn't want to do that. You know, he wasn't in it for the reward. This guy might just be weeping, not just because he loved her, but just because he's, you know, missing out on some status. I don't know. Maybe he did love her. I'm not sure. I know this much, though. If you love something, you don't just let it get taken from you without a fight. And that's exactly what this guy did. I don't really have a lot of sympathy for this guy because he just, I mean, he, he's told, let her go, and he just goes. He, he, said, he said, hey, go back. And he just turns around and goes back. He's weak. 
Somebody try to come and take my wife from me, it's, it ain't happening without a fight. You have to kill me. I'm, and literally, you would have to kill me. Or knock me unconscious. You'd have to get really crafty. You'd have to sneak up on me. Right? There'd have to be like a trap involved or a crowbar. You'd have to go full just Nancy Kerrigan and hit me in the knee <laughs> and take me out if, before I'm just going to let my wife go. Why? Because she didn't come easy. I'm not going to let her go easy. And this guy, Fal, you know, Fal, Fal, I tell, or Faltai, excuse me, I wrote it wrong. The Bible has it right. Faltai, no wonder I couldn't pronounce it. You know, he just lets her go because she came easy. Oh, uh, hey, you want a wife? Here you go. Oh, thanks. Oh, the king, I'll get to be the king's son in law. Cool. You know, this guy's sad. He's weak. He just lets her go. And, you know, people want to feel bad for him, but you know what? He knew who he married. You think he didn't know the backstory here? You think he didn't know that he was marrying David's wife? You know, so he's not really worthy of a lot of sympathy. <clears throat> he knew who he was marrying. So, you know, that's kind of the principle that we see here in this passage, is that when things come easy to people, they tend to let them go real easy too, don't they? <clears throat> and it's the people that, you know, really put in the hard work, that make the sacrifices, that, you know, wait for things to come, that, that, that things come to them difficult through difficulties, that things come hard to them. They're the ones that hang on to those things. They're the ones that are, you know, don't just give them up so easily. You know, Abner just didn't give up on the house of Saul that easily because he had a lot invested in there. You know, and, and David, you know, he wasn't just going to give up on my call even after all those years and all those other wives he got because he had a lot invested in that relationship. And you say, well, what's, that pre what's the application here tonight? Well, let's make this application. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. Think about this. Think about how, how, what's something that comes real easy to us? What's something that came to real easy to all of us? I'm not looking for a question. I'm just trying to get your attention. <laughs> I'm not looking for an answer. I'm trying to get your attention. I don't want to corner people. But one thing that came easy to us is salvation. Salvation came real easy, didn't it? If it didn't, you're not saved. <laughs> right? No, I worked real hard for my salvation, and you didn't get it. And you're unsaved, because salvation, you know, for by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We all understand that. I you're going on about that. But salvation sure came easy. You know what the temptation then is for a lot of saved people? To take it for granted. To take the Christian life for granted. Just look at, like it's some kind of a drudgery to be born. Why? It's because you don't, maybe you don't understand you know, what you really have in Christ. Maybe you're taking it for granted. People can take salvation grant for granted. Because, but here's the thing. Did it come easy for Jesus? It didn't. I mean, he's the one that did everything. Right? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So how do we get this lively hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead? Meaning he had to die for us, right? And what did we get in return? What has come so easily to us? Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Look, it's reserved in heaven for us. Meaning it's, it cannot be taken away. That, you've already, it, you're, you're already there practically. You know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. <clears throat> That's what we have, but it came through Christ's death. In verse 5, it says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold, perisheth, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, verse 8, whom having not seen, ye love. Whom having not seen, ye love. You know, hopefully that's the case with us tonight. Is that, you know, we haven't seen Christ. All, you know, all we have are, is, is the Bible. That's what we base our faith on. And hopefully, you know, we've been in it and we've learned to appreciate it to the point where we love God and love Christ simply because of what's written in this book. And we're not just taking our salvation for granted. 
just because it came easy. And that is the tendency. That is human nature. Look at verse 13. Look, because we, you know, Christ died, he was resurrected, we received all these things. We have an inheritance that's incorruptible, reserved in heaven for us. It's not going to fade away. And then, you know, he asked some things. Verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, I don't think it's too much to ask for Christ to say, hey, if, you know, now that you're saved, live for me. You know, I died for you, he's saying. Why don't you go ahead and live for me? Why don't you gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and serve Christ? At verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. What is he saying in this passage? Don't take your salvation for granted. Don't just say, Well, I got my ticket stamped. I got my fire pass. You know, I, I'm not going to hell. I'm just going to continue to live, you know, to the lusts of the flesh. He's saying, no, don't do that. Don't live to the lust of the flesh. You know, as he has, which has called you is holy, so be ye holy. Don't take it for granted. You know, you show me the Christian who's saved, but isn't living for God and is living some wicked backslidden life. I'll show you a Christian who's taking their salvation for granted. <clears throat> I mean, look at verse, uh, verse 18. For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Yes, our salvation came easy, and we shouldn't take it for granted. Our salvation came easy to us, but it didn't come easy for Christ. It came by what? His precious blood. That's what brought salvation to us. I mean, that's what you're saying. That's what you know, when you take salvation for granted. You're taking the blood of Christ for granted. You know, he's the one that did all the hard work. Go over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, he said in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. How did we come into this fold? How do we become one of Christ's flock? How do we become his sheep? Because he laid down his life for us. Don't take that for granted. It, you know, it might have come easy to us. And here's the thing. We just read it, today. we just saw, you know, several examples in, in 2 Samuel chapter 3 where things came easy to people and they took them for granted. And they let them go easy. And nothing, you know, salvation has come very easy to us. You know, all we got to do is believe. It's so simple. But what the tendency is, is that we could take it for granted. Verse 27, he said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. You know what I love about the fact that salvation came hard for Jesus? is because he's not going to let us go either. You know, people that put a lot of blood, like Jesus did, that people, blood, sweat, and tears and things, that don't let things go easy. I mean, this is hard. I mean, the Christ coming down here and dying for us, and, and, and going to hell and coming back and living a God, fulfilling the law, everything that he did, that was hard. You know, he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. But he was tempted. You know, it wasn't like Christ just came down here and life was a breeze. You know, he had the same temptations and trials that you and I have. He was just, yeah, he was without sin. You know, he got weary, he got sleepy, he was tempted of the devil. I mean, he got drug out in the wilderness, fasting for 40 days had Satan himself come and tempt him. You know, that, that's some serious persecution that he went through. He invested a lot in us. You know what that means to us? Is that he's never going to let us go. Because it, we didn't come easy to him. And when things don't come easy to people, they don't let them go. And it's not just that, you know, we have this eternal security. I mean, we do, right? We don't want to get this attitude either. It's like, well, I know I'm eternally secure, but, you know, and God's just kind of putting up with us. It's like, well, you know, I got a lot invested in those sinners down there. I guess I'll just put up with them. It's not like that. Not only has he, you know, uh, done all that hard work for us, and he's keeping us because of it, but, you know, he also gives us mercy day by day. There's all, you know, go over to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. 
you know, our sins, they're, they're, you know, he saves us, and it's not like he just puts up with our sins. He says, well, you know, I got a lot invested in him. I just got, you know, I'd be ashamed to let him go now, after all, everything Jesus did for him. After everything my son went through for them, I, you know, I can't, I can't just give up on him. No, he, he you know what? He, he saves us, and then he shows us mercy every morning, mercy day by day. He says in uh, 1 John 2, I'll read to you, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It's not like just this one-time thing where, you know, you get saved and God's just like, okay, I'm just going to put up with you until you get to heaven. It's like, no, you can come to God and get right, you know, no matter how far away from the Lord people have gotten or how backslidden they are, they can always come back to God. Why? Because he's invested a lot <laughs> And into it. He's put a lot into them. He put the blood of Christ into them. You know, he sent his son to die for the sins of the world. Verse John 1 9, we know this one. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So look, there's there's a tendency in human nature for people to just take things for granted. That's what we saw tonight, first Samuel or Second Samuel chapter 3. You know, things that come easy to people, they tend to take them for granted. And things that people have to work for and patiently wait for, they appreciate those things. And look, there's a lot of things in this life that we could take for granted. We could take a lot of different things in this life for granted. But you know, salvation should never be one of them. We should never take our salvation for granted. I mean, I know we're eternally secure, but does that mean we should just live however we want and just do whatever we want? Isn't that what we always get accused of? Oh, you're just teaching people that they could do whatever they want and still go to heaven. Well, yeah, that is true. That doesn't mean we should, though. You know, it's funny that the, the, the people that believe that tend to leave the godliest lives. You know, it's funny. We go knock on these doors and, and people say, what does it take to get? Well, be a good person. Go to church. It's like you haven't been to church in years. <laughs> if you really believe that, I'll see, I'll see you tonight. You know, I'll see you on Sunday then, right? That's, you know, that's not usually how it goes. The people that live in the godliest lives are the ones who what? Who don't take their salvation for granted. Just because it came easy, they understand that, you know, a great price was paid and that they want to, you know, they want to serve God because of it, because they love the Lord, because they don't want to just take it for granted. You know, and that's something we got to keep in mind, is that in this life, you know, the things that come easy, we tend to let go of easily. So if we have to work for something, we have to put in some effort, you know, don't, don't get bitter or angry and complain about that. You should be grateful for that, that you had to work to get something. You know, you'll appreciate it more when you finally get it. Let's go ahead and pray.